Good morning, welcome. So glad you've joined us this morning. And if this is your first time, we want to say a special welcome to you and certainly hope it'll be many more times we'll see you back. But would ask this morning if you would click on the digital connection card up above and just let us know who you are and maybe if there's something that you would like prayer for. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you and say thanks for joining us again this morning. So we're into springtime. Grateful for uh, Dan Feldman and the good work uh, he leaned into on Thursday. He was able to cut the yard for the first time and he and I installed the changing stations in the restroom here on the main floor and also in the men's room downstairs. As we think about the week ahead, again, we're meeting in person and we'll be in the building at 10 a.m. this morning, but grateful that you found time to join us this morning here online. And so with that, let's lean into a time of worship through music. Jesus. And I love people. 
I want to invite you, your family, our friends, and lots and lots of neighbors to join me at Community as I make my life all about this mission of helping people find their way back to God. We're in our second week of this new series called Bless. Last week was an overview of where we're going. And this week, we're going to just dive a little bit deeper into the first point. You know, we're using this acrostic, the word bless. And so this first week is all about to begin with prayer. Now, the reality is that crazy things can happen when we pray. So let me start by telling you a story. It's a story about a popular author and a gifted Bible teacher. Many of you may know her, Beth Moore. And it's interesting, as she tells the story, she was sitting in an airport. Her Bible was open on her lap, and she was enjoying some time reading between flights. And she was also praying. And when she glanced up and noticed there was an older gentleman sitting in a wheelchair just across the, uh, the room from her. He was abnormally thin, and he was slumped over. But then there was something strange she thought about him. It was his hair. It was stringy. It was tangled. It was hung well over his shoulders. And it actually went down part of his back. Now, Beth uh, tried to stop staring, but something in her began to stir with emotion for this bizarre-looking older gentleman. And so here in Beth's own words, she says, I had walked with God long enough to see the handwriting on the wall. I've learned that when I begin to feel what God feels, something so contrary to my natural feelings, something dramatic is bound to happen. I immediately began to resist. I started arguing with God in my mind. Oh, no, God, please no. Don't make me witness to this man. And then I heard it. I don't want you to witness to him. I want you to brush his hair. She says that the words were spoken so clear that her heart leapt into her throat and her thoughts spun like a top. And after several agonizing moments, trying to reason with God in her mind, this prompting was absolutely ridiculous. A red-faced, tentative Beth Moore approached the older gentleman and knelt down before him. She said, may I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? To which he responded in volume 10, little lady, if you expect me to hear you, you're going to have to talk louder than that. And at this point, She says, I took a deep breath and I blurted out, Sir, may I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? She says, every eye in the place darted right to me. I watched him look up at me with absolute shock on his face and say, If you really want to. Are you kidding? She says, of course I didn't want to. But God didn't seem interested in my personal preference right about then. Yes, sir, I would be pleased but I have one little problem. I don't have a hairbrush. He responded, I have one in my bag. Beth went to the back of the wheelchair. She unzipped the stranger's old carry-on bag to retrieve his hairbrush. And she started brushing this older gentleman's hair. She continues to say, a miraculous thing happened to me as I started brushing that old man's hair. Everybody else in the room disappeared. There was no one alive for those moments except that gentleman and me. I brushed and I brushed and I brushed until every tangle was out. I know this sounds so strange, but I've never felt that kind of love for another soul in my entire life. I believe with all my heart, I, for that few moments, felt a portion of the very love of God. The emotions were so strong and so pure that I knew they had to be God's. His hair was finally as soft and smooth as an infant's. I slipped the brush back in the bag, went around the chair to face him. I got back down on my knees, put my hands on his knees and said, Sir, do you know my Jesus? He said, Yes, I do. I've known him since I married my bride. She wouldn't marry me until I had got to know the Savior, he said. You see, the problem is, I haven't seen my bride in many months. I had open heart surgery and she has been too ill to come to see me. I was sitting here thinking to myself, 
what a mess I must be for my bride. And then Beth Moore concludes, Only God knows how often he allows us to be part of a divine moment when we're completely unaware of the significance. God had intervened in details only he could have known. It was a God moment, and I'll never forget it. I don't know about you, when I hear stories like this, I'm touched. Uh, We might even tear up a little. But is anyone else willing to admit that stories like this are also terrifying? I mean, a little terrifying, right? Sure, we love to hear about them when they're about other people, but we're not so sure we want to find ourselves doing crazy things like this. So I'm going to be straight up with you uh, today. If you and I are going to take the mission of Jesus seriously, we are in for an adventure. There's no telling where he might send us and what he might lead us to do. Following Jesus isn't meant to be comfortable. It's meant to be life-changing. Now, we're in this series called Bless, How to Bless Your Neighbor. And it's about our mission of love God and love others, no limits. Now, understand that this isn't just the mission of Linden Road. To be honest, this is your mission, this is my mission, this is our mission together. And yet, too often, rather than getting into the game, we actually sit on the sidelines. In fact, last week, we we talked a little bit about how we hope people will love God and love others. But the reality is, is that we have to be on mission to help people do that, to help people find their way back to who God is and what he wants for them. So during this series, we're, we're going to be challenging one another to live the mission of Jesus, to love God, love others with no limits. And I know through the years, we, we've discovered that the best way to live this mission is to be a blessing. We, we've seen that, and you all have done an amazing job with that, even the good work that we do individually to bless others. Because we know that we need to be a blessing to those people and even the places that God puts in our lives. Now, as we looked last week, and we need to look again, is that the blessing strategy isn't anything new. As we look in Genesis, when God tells Abram, that his people are blessed to be a blessing, every one of us has been blessed to be a blessing. That's what we get to carry. That's our inheritance from from the good work that Abram did centuries, millennia ago. And so during this message series, we want to be challenging to each other to identify the people and the places we've been called to bless. As a reminder, this acronym BLESS stands for five missional practices we can carry out every day. And today we're going to talk about the very first one, B. It begins with prayer. There's lots of reasons why we don't pray. Prayer is just one of those things. It's sort of like a flossing or exercise or going to bed at a decent hour. We know we should do it, but we often don't do it. When you go to the dentist, the dentist asks you if you're flossing regularly. How many of us are tempted to lie in that situation? Now, I don't want to tell my dentist that I'm not doing what I know I should do. So maybe the best way to respond is, well, I'm flossing the same amount as the last time you asked me. That's pretty safe, right? (laughs) Prayer can be like that for most of us. It's something we know we should do, something we even want to do, but it can be hard to be consistent at it. And why is that? If you remember a few years ago, we actually walked through a 40-day challenge of uh, on prayer. And I would remind you that, that you can get those messages on our podcast and can listen to them again. And I know there was lots of great conversation as we did a, a weekly small groups around that whole conversation. Why is it that we don't pray? Well, there's lots of reasons. Let me just uh, tackle a couple of them. I mean, sometimes we, we don't pray because we don't know how. Many of us learn to pray as children, mostly at meals and at bedtime. But how many people reach adulthood without any additional instruction? We know we should pray, but many of us aren't sure how to. Sometimes we don't pray because I'm too busy. Let's face it, prayer takes time. It takes focus. It takes energy. And in this season, many of us feel like we're just running short on all that. You see, our busy life crowds out a lot of things that we know are important. And often that includes prayer. And sometimes we don't pray because, well, I doubt it works, right? I mean, we've all been there. 
we, we think, I, I prayed, I really did, and it didn't seem to make any difference. I felt that way before. Maybe it's led you to question whether even you believe in prayer. When we pray and nothing seems to happen, it makes prayer really difficult. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we don't pray, but today I, I want to challenge all of us, every one of us, myself included, to move beyond just hoping people love God and love others and actually start helping. And so this idea, we're going to begin with prayer. And we do this by beginning with prayer. We have a great motivation for doing so. The best reason to become a person who consistently prays is because we follow someone whose life was characterized by prayer. I mean, we know that Jesus began with prayer, right? Jesus is the one we follow. His whole life was a blessing to the world. Every place that he went, every person he encountered, experienced a God moment in his presence. Jesus lived out the blessed practices in his daily life on earth, and he did that by beginning with prayer. Now, if you read through the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, they tell Jesus' story, right? And you'll see there's a consistent pattern of prayer in his life. And there's all sorts of, let's just look at a few of them. Look, chapter 3, Jesus prays at his baptism. And the heavens are opened as he is filled with the Holy Spirit and blessed by the Father. And then Luke chapter 5, Jesus had a regular practice of withdrawing from the crowds by himself to pray. Luke chapter 9, Jesus prayed before performing miracles, asking the Father to bless the work he was doing. Luke chapter 22, Jesus prayed for his friends that they would remain strong in their faith. And a little farther on in Luke 22, he, Jesus spent the night before his crucifixion alone in a garden praying. And so over and over again, we see Jesus making prayer a priority. And let's focus in on just one of those occasions. It was a time when Jesus was deciding whom to invest his time, effort, and energy in, take his mission and move it forward. And you guessed it, where does he start? Well, with prayer. So let's look again at Dr. Luke. What does he say? One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated as apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Jesus wanted to identify the people he would invest his life in. There were quite a few candidates around who could have become his apprentices. I am sure that, that in that pool of candidates, there were some uh, that had amazing potential that was recognizable right away. And I'm sure that there were some that seemed to have leadership skills. And I'm sure that there were some whose personalities made them seem like obvious choices. However, because Jesus knew that the stakes were high, that through these guys he would be able to bless even more people, he spent the night in prayer, a whole night praying to his Father. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what he, Jesus prayed. He does not tell us how the Father confirmed the right people for Jesus to invite. But what he does tell us is that in the morning, when it was time to choose, Jesus had clear direction. The choices he made were not the obvious choices for some reason. For some reason, he chooses fishermen, tax collectors, a religious zealot, and even the man who would later betray him. Now, why is that important? Well, because, you see, when we begin with prayer, when we begin asking God to lead us to those he's calling us to bless, the choices may not be as obvious as we may first expect them to be. So let me give you an example. Let me introduce Rodrigo Cano and hear his story. Two years ago, I was still living in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I had been praying to God for God to show me who I needed to bless. And I have to be honest, I did not hear a voice, an angel did not appear to me, but it was more like a hunch, a feeling that I needed to go to a place called the downtown market. And so I go there, I park my car, I start walking and I start praying. And all of a sudden, I see a man who's standing by the door, and you can see that his clothes are dirty, he looks unkept, and he's asking for money. As I get closer, I realize that he's also speaking Spanish, and once again, I did not hear a voice, but it was something inside of me that told me that I needed to do something. So I get close to this man, 
And I ask him, hey, is there anything that I can do for you? And so he tells me that the ministry that feeds the homeless in the city was closed for the day and he was really, really, really hungry. He had not eaten anything. So I invite him to eat some tacos with me. When we're there, I tell him, order as much as you want. He tells me, I don't want to abuse your generosity. So he orders a few tacos and while we're eating, we're having conversations about family and about different things. On our way out, before we said our goodbyes, I, I told him, you know what? I'm a Christ follower, and I just want to let you know that God loves you. When he heard those words, his eyes started to tear up. And so he tells me, you know, my brother is a pastor in Mexico, and I spoke to him this week, and he told me that God was going to send someone to remind me how much God loves me, and you're that person. I started to tear up as well, and, and we, started, we started to pray. I prayed for him, and we exchanged numbers. I, I committed to follow up with him. The following week, um, I'm trying to reach out to him and looking for him, and I, I'm asking around, and they tell me that he decided to go back to Mexico because he knew that he needed to change, to do a change in his life, and he knew that he couldn't make it in Michigan. I know that we are supposed to bless, but I've never imagined that the answer to my prayer was the answer to somebody else's prayer thousands of miles away. What an amazing story from Rodrigo, where he talks about this prompting that he had to bless a homeless man. If you and I really want to be a part of helping people love God and love others with no limits, we have to begin with prayer. We can no longer be a church that just hopes people will figure it out. We need to ask God to show us how we can do our part to help people love him and love others, how they can come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I know it's risky, and I know it can feel incredibly uncomfortable, but you see, only God knows the impact that you and I can make in someone's life when we choose to be a blessing. And we know it has to begin with prayer. Because you see, it's in prayer where we open ourselves to God and the leading of his spirit. You see, it's in prayer we focus our minds to recognize his promptings, to hear him speak. It's in prayer we receive the direction we need to discover the people and the places that God is calling us to bless. Maybe you've heard of this name, Hudson Taylor. He was a British missionary to China a couple centuries ago, almost now. And he said this, do not have your concert first and then tune your instrument afterwards. Begin the day with the word of God in prayer and get first of all into harmony with him. You see, to live out the mission of loving God and loving others and helping people understand that, we have to begin with prayer. So my challenge for all of us, including myself, is to set aside some time every day to pray. We don't have to start by praying all night like Jesus did, but we can all begin somewhere. Here's a practical way to get started. First, you need to plan. Things that are important to us get on our calendars. They become a priority. If we want to be intentional about setting aside time to pray, we need to plan for it. Perhaps you might decide to pray for five minutes before you get out of bed in the morning, and five minutes before you get in bed, before you close your eyes to sleep. Or you might set a reminder on your phone to pray during your lunch hour or some other time of the day. If we're going to move beyond hoping to helping, we need to plan times to begin with prayer. Then it's about prepare. So as you pray, ask God to prepare your heart for the adventure. As I've said, if you're going to take the mission of Jesus seriously, we're going to be in for an adventure. There's no telling where he might send us and what he might lead us to do. We need to prepare for that. We need to prepare our hearts for the adventure that's going to come. We need to ask God to give us eyes to see how he is leading us and the courage then to follow him. And then finally, this third step is we need to ask God to show us the people and the places. The people and places he's calling us to bless. So as you pray, make a mental map of the places you will visit during the day. Who are the people that you will encounter? In fact, this week and all throughout this series, we want to challenge one another to identify the people and the places God is calling us to bless. So take a look in the notes section and you'll see a link to a card similar to this one. 
You can download it, uh, put it on your desktop or on your phone. And here's where it's going to be important. As we begin with prayer, we need to challenge each one of us to ask God, who are the people and where are the places you're calling us to bless? And as we begin with prayer, we want to challenge every one of us to ask God, who are the people and where are the places you're calling me to bless? Now think about it. Maybe it's your coworkers in the office. Students, maybe it's a classmate. Maybe it's the neighbors that live on your block or down the street, around the corner, across the backyard. Maybe it's the families from your children's soccer team or baseball team or swim team or other activities that you might be involved with. Maybe it's the business owners in your networking group. Maybe it's a fellow teacher. Maybe it's the staff at your favorite coffee shop or fast food restaurant. If you're not sure, I want you to use this card this week to begin with prayer, to begin asking God to show you who he's calling you to bless. If you know the people or the places God is calling you to bless, write them down on the back of this card and start praying for those people and places this week. And in that, you're asking God for the opportunity to bless. Maybe it's you'll have an opportunity to meet a practical need they have. Or maybe you'll have an opportunity to provide a listening ear. Maybe you'll have an opportunity to invite someone to join us in person for worship or even online here. Begin with prayer to identify the people and the places God is calling you to bless. And then ask God for an opportunity. I've said it many times that following Jesus isn't meant to be comfortable. It's meant to be life-changing. The mission of helping people love God and love others is an adventure. There's no telling where he might send us and what he might lead us to do. And, and, and yeah, we're, we're all moved by stories about hairbrushes and tacos. But can you imagine what it would be like not to just hear those stories, but to actually get a chance to live them? So let's move beyond hoping people will love God and love others, but actually helping them do that. And to do that, let's begin with prayer. So in fact, today we're going to do our prayer time a little bit different. I want you to take an opportunity right now where we're going to take and spend some time in prayer. I want to guide you through a moment of prayer where we're going to ask God for a few things. First, let's ask God to give us the desire to pray. Second, let's ask God to prepare our hearts for the adventure. And third, let's ask God to give us clarity as to the people and the places he's calling us to bless. And so let's pray. And in this moment, just talk to God in the quietness of your own heart where you find yourself this morning, these things. God, we we do pray that you would give us the desire to pray. And Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts for this adventure you're calling us to. And then God, we we pray that you'd give us clarity as to the people and the places that you're calling us to bless. God, you are awesome. No one compares to you. We come confessing this many times. We struggle to pray. We're grateful and we thank you for the opportunity you give us to come before you as your sons and daughters. And so today, this morning, we ask, give us a desire to pray, prepare our hearts to bless others, and make it evident into the places and the people who you are calling us to bless. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our worship.
Thanks for joining us this week. So grateful that you found time. And to be reminded, you are blessed to be a blessing. Go forth and serve Christ in his name. Amen. Have a great week.